Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's great to be with you on this Family Day weekend. I trust that uh, God is allowing you the time to be with your families this weekend. Uh, a special welcome to those who are gathering online. If you are jumping in to join our service today, we just thank you for uh, being a part of it and encourage you, as I encourage those in person, that we are coming before an incredibly good God today. A God that loves us, a God that is uh, good to us and faithful to us and who um, deserves our praise. And out of that, not just like him pointing the finger and saying, you have to praise me, but fills us with his spirit so that we can do it uh, just from our hearts. And that, that it's out of that transformation that we come before him today and we want to give him everything. We want to give him everything. So uh, let's stand on our feet and let us just take time before God in prayer as we allow him to do that work in our hearts so that we can give him praise and honor. Will you pray with me this morning? Jesus, I just thank you uh, for this time, for this place, for a chance to be with you, God. Uh, you promise your presence with us, God, and I just thank you that you're that kind of God, uh, not a God who, who uh, did all this stuff so that we can still be kind of far away from you, God, but no, you've, you've made it possible for us to be close to you. And that you've been faithful and you've never, you've never left us alone, God, but your presence remains with us. And so we have so much to be thankful for, Jesus. Uh, we want to make much of you. We want to give you everything. And so we do ask your Holy Spirit to do a work in our hearts so that out of our uh, mouths and, and with our whole life that we, we can just love you and praise you and, and give you glory. And so as a church, we want to do that. Um, so enable that, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's keep our eyes on Jesus this morning and, uh, and just have that assurance as we worship. Oh, we look to the sun, set our eyes on the Savior, see the image of love, sing his praises forever. Tearing through the dead of night See the kingdom burst into color at the speed of light And freedom shaking up the atmosphere As the shadows fade into nothing as the day of our God who's reached out to us beyond the sky.
reaching out for us the everlasting one Jesus our God be on the skies of Why do we look to Jesus? Well, I think he's given us every reason why. Uh, he's not a savior that is dead in the grave somewhere, just like all of the other messengers that have come and gone and have spoken for God or whatever, but Jesus lives. He conquered death, and he is alive, and uh, that is why he deserves our praise this morning. So let's continue with that thought to sing to the living Lord, the living hope. This is what Jesus has done for you. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could.
can we pray? Jesus, thank you so much. Uh, just as we pause and think about the words of that song, while we were singing, and even now, God, um, we have hope. Today, we have hope in a world that doesn't seem like it has a lot of it. Today, because of Jesus, because of his resurrection, as followers of Jesus, as people filled with your spirit, as people knowing we have a Father in heaven that loves us, we have hope today. Uh, hope for transformation, uh, hope for the future, hope for what you want to do and the changes you want to do in your heart. It's possible, God, because you have the power and we have hope. And so, God, help us just to know that today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, thank you, worship team. Jason, anytime you want to pray, we will pray. Welcome to South Delta Baptist Church. If you are new here this morning or joining us for the first time, my name is Jordan. I'm one of the pastors here. Thank you for coming and joining us to worship on this family day long weekend, and I hope you are enjoying this family day long weekend. Now, in my family context, me and my wife just had our first child, a daughter named Lennon. She's just shy of four months old, and so obviously she can't really comprehend or understand a long weekend, or so we thought. Clearly, she's a genius. I'm just saying, I'm just saying. So last night at about midnight, she woke up and she was ready to rock and roll and didn't seem to want to sleep anymore. So we managed to get her to go back to sleep. Then she woke up at 2 a.m. wide awake and ready to go. We managed to get her to go back to sleep. 4 a.m. rolled around and she was ready to rock and roll once again. She seemed to be doing some workouts in her bassinet with her arms and legs. And so my wife employed a strategy of moving her into the bed to see if that might help. I'm going to pause right here. Every time I've said we, what I mean is my wife has helped put the baby back to bed. She is a champion. I've kind of woken up and kept sleeping. And so at about 6 a.m. right before my alarm went off, just kind of rolled over, opened my eyes, and what do I see? Two eyes staring right at me. Oh, hello, Daddy. Are you awake? It's time to go. So obviously, we are enjoying Family Day long weekend. I hope you are as well, and that you enjoy time with family, especially tomorrow. And if you are new here this morning, we would love for you to call SDBC your church family, your church home. One of the best ways to explore SDBC, to learn more about us, is by filling out a Connect card or a digital 
digital connect card. Best way to do that right now is by hitting the connect button on our live stream platform or heading to our website and hitting the connect with you button. Or if you're here this morning, I invite you to head out into the foyer where you can fill out a connect card. This is a great way for you to start to learn more about us, to sign up for our weekly e-newsletter. This is one of the best ways to follow everything that's happening here at the church, to sign up for a community group, or to even meet with one of the pastors to get to know us a little bit better. So I invite you to fill out that card here this morning. Only real big announcement here this morning is next week we are going to be celebrating communion together. And so if you're going to be joining us online, just a reminder to prepare the elements at home next week. You know, we're, we are approaching the, the two-year mark of COVID. We've gone through a lot of challenge and uncertainty. But one thing I am very thankful for is the ability that we've had through technology to remain one united church meeting in multiple locations, especially when it comes to sharing communion together. Together. So just a reminder for next week, we will be celebrating communion. At this point in the service, I'm going to pray and uh, release our kids to their kids program right after I finish praying. We're also going to pray for this morning's offering. Would you please pray with me? Father God, thank you for this opportunity that we have to gather together on this family day long weekend. Thank you for the uniqueness of what church is that through a relationship with you, we are adopted into your family as brothers and sisters, as children in this new family of God. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather together to worship you, to glorify you. Father, we pray this morning for all of the kids that will be heading to their kids program and learning about you, learning what it means to be a part of your family, to be a Christ follower. So we pray a blessing on our kids as they learn and dive into a, a fun program this morning. And we also pray for our offering this morning, Lord, that it would go to communicating just how amazing a God you are that it would go towards our many ministries that are about communicating the gospel, the good news of how you have changed everything for us through your life, death, and resurrection, that when we place our hope and trust in you, we can be forgiven of our sins, we can be adopted into your family, that we can have right relationship with you, eternal relationship with you. May this offering go towards our ministries and also everything that we do as individuals, all geared around communicating the gospel and seeing your kingdom expand. Even in a world that is going through so many challenges right now, the uncertainty that we face, we pray, Lord, that people would recognize the hope that we have in you and that that would cause them to become curious and that, that we would see people coming into a saving relationship with you, Jesus. We pray all this in your name. Amen. Well, I'm also excited to be preaching here this morning. Uh, continuing our Church on Mission series in the book of Acts. This morning, we're going to be in Acts chapter 21, looking at verses 1 to 16. Now, last week in our text, we saw the Apostle Paul bid farewell to the Ephesian elders. He had spent around three years in Ephesus ministering to the people there, and it was a very heartfelt goodbye. Paul hopped on a ship, and he's now headed to Jerusalem. He is obediently following the strong nudging and compulsion of the Holy Spirit. And so what we're going to see in our text this morning is that Paul was loved far and wide as he makes a number of stops on his way to Jerusalem. But we're also going to see something really fascinating emerge from our text. As he makes these stops, prompted by the Holy Spirit, Friends of Paul are going to sound the alarm, warning him not to go to Jerusalem. Have you ever been in a situation where you've disagreed with someone when it comes to discerning the will of God or discerning God's direction on something? Maybe it could be related to a specific call that God has placed on your life or a friend's life. Maybe it has to do with a specific course of action a significant decision, or maybe even when it comes to prophetic insight. And when I say prophetic insight, what I mean is when God reveals something directly to you regarding the future. When you've been in this situation, when this is the case, what does it look like for us to obediently move forward discerning God's will when it comes to that calling, course of action, and decision? 
And what does it look like to remain unified when there is disagreement regarding that decision and when the decision is finally made? As I read through our text this morning, immediately afterwards, a memory came to mind that I think perfectly captures what's going on in our text here this morning. In my early 20s, I was part of a very tight-knit and large community group here at SDBC made up of a number of young adults. And part of the reason why I think it was a larger and tight-knit group was because we did something very unique. Uh, Every Tuesday, a couple from the church, Bill and Val Gibson, would open up their home, and 30 to 40 young adults would gather together. We'd enjoy a time of fellowship and hanging out, coffee. Sometimes we would do bigger meals together. But then at around 7.30 or so, we would break to smaller groups. Bill and Val had a number of open spaces in their home, and so three different community groups would break. So we had this larger hangout time, and then we would break into smaller groups. And at this point in my life, uh, a friend of ours from this community, uh, from my community group and part of our young adults group, he kind of revealed to us one day that he was really wrestling with a specific call that God was placing on his heart, that he he felt that God was really prompting him to do this. And here's what it was. It was to actually join the Canadian military as a reservist and do a tour in Afghanistan. So this was about 10 to 15 years ago. Now, in our West Coast culture, specifically here, The military isn't really a big part of our lives, especially with our young adult community back when I was in uh, my early 20s. So this really came out of left field. And so this friend of ours came to us and said, hey, you know, I really need help discerning this. Would you please pray with me and, and give me some feedback? Let me know what you're thinking. And so it was really interesting. Over the next few weeks, as people were praying and trying to help discern this call that this friend had mentioned to us and revealed to us, there was a real spectrum of people's responses. Some people affirmed this call for this person, our friend, to move forward with this. Some people kind of took the middle ground. Hey, you know, we'll keep praying, but if this is really something you feel strongly about, okay. And then other people disagreed. They really weren't sure if this was God's will. It seemed a little bit dangerous. Well, our friend in the end made the decision to go. And it was really quite beautiful. We gathered around as our friend was gearing up to go to basic training, and we laid hands over our friend and and prayed for this person. When they came back after doing their tour, it was really interesting. You know, they, they said, you know, they still felt like God wanted them to go, but they still weren't really sure with the why. God had called them to do this, but didn't lay out points A, B, and C as to why. And for our friends, they kind of mentioned some stories. For example, they said that they were the only Christian that was a part of this group of soldiers that they went on this tour with, and they had a number of conversations about God. They had an opportunity to pray with some of these other soldiers that didn't know Christ, But during his time there, none of them decided to follow Christ, and he wasn't really sure what that was going to look like moving forward. Felt a call to go, wasn't really sure what to expect, and when they came back, wasn't wasn't 100% sure with if this was something that really made sense for them to do, but they still felt strongly that, yes, God called them, and this was something that they were meant to do. They really wrestled and grappled with this, as our young adults group did as well. When it comes to God placing a call on our lives, when it comes to discerning God's will, I think sometimes maybe the more radical in nature that is, it can cause us to really wrestle with and grapple with what that call might look like. And this could also be why there could be disagreement that might emerge as we try to wrestle with God's will when it comes to a call or deciding on a course of action. This is the reality that Paul faces in our text here this morning when he encounters these different sources of people raising these alarm bells. It's a fascinating look at what it means to be obedient to a call and what it looks like to remain united when there is disagreement, especially when that decision has been made. 
So let's dive into our text here this morning. We're going to be looking at Acts chapter 21, verses 1 to 16. So if you want to open up your Bibles or open up your Bible app, we'll read through the full section together, and then we'll start to zero in on these friends raising the alarm bells. So Acts chapter 21, verses 1 to 16. And when we had parted from them and set sail, we came by a straight course to Coes, and the next day to Rhodes, and from there to Patera. And having found a ship crossing to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. When we had come in sight of Cyprus, leaving it on the left, we called to Syria and landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to unload its cargo. And having sought out the disciples, we stayed there seven days. And through the Spirit, they were telling Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. When our days there ended, we departed and went on our journey, and they all, with wives and children, accompanied us until we were outside the city. And kneeling down on the beach, we prayed and said farewell to one another. Then we went on board the ship, and they returned home. When we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we, ar- we arrived at Ptolemus, and we greeted the brothers and stayed with them for one day. On the next day, we departed and came to Caesarea, and we entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. While we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea, and coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, This is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the people there urged him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What are you doing? weeping and breaking my heart. For I am ready not only to be imprisoned, but to even die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we ceased and said, let the will of the Lord be done. And after these days, we got ready and went up to Jerusalem. And some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us, bringing us to the house of Manasseh of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we should lodge. So, as we read through this longer section of text, something uh, that might emerge right away is that it kind of reads almost like a bit of a travel diary. There's a lot of details in here. And so, something really interesting to point out right here in verse 1 is the use of we language, right? So, you'll see it for example, right here, and then you'll see it again right here. And when we had parted from them and set sail, we came by a straight course to coast. So, in the bigger and flowing narrative of Acts, there's been a shift that's taken place between the use of the third-person perspective and here, the first-person perspective. What this means is that the author of Acts, Luke, is actually now a part of this journey. He's one of Paul's travel companions. And so it kind of is a travel diary. The, uh, Luke is giving us very specific details regarding this journey back to Jerusalem. Now, Luke is a physician, and so he's very detailed-oriented. And there's a real mix here of personal details and travel details. And sometimes we can lose some of the personal details because of all the travel details. Right away here in this first verse, it says, when and when we had parted. Now, when we think of the word parted, right, maybe you part from some friends and say goodbye. The ESV version of the Bible uses the word parted. It could be a little bit more muted. For example, if you look at the NIV, the word here, the language here is torn away. Once again, highlighting just how much Paul is loved. That he was torn away from them and set sail. Once again, not to underscore the very real danger that Paul is facing as he makes this journey back to Jerusalem. Now, 
I'm not going to pick apart all of the travel details here. If you are a geography buff and enthusiast, I encourage you to go home this afternoon, pull out your maps and your study Bible, and you can kind of plot out this amazing adventure and journey of Paul. For example, if you love Wordle, you should try Global if you love geography. But suffice it to say, this is a big journey. And that's why we see a number of different stops. And stops along the coast that involve switching ships to take a much bigger sea journey that will eventually land them in Tyre. It's a very long and large and big journey back to Jerusalem. And so they land in Tyre, and we come to our first major stop, where the Apostle Paul spends seven days with some disciples. And we can tell by the way that Paul departs from them that this was a sweet time of of fellowship and enjoying relational time with the Apostle Paul. But this is also where we see the first alarm bell raised. We get this in verse 4 in our text. And through the Spirit, they were telling Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. Through the Spirit, they were telling Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. And remember, this is a first-hand account that Luke is providing, very detailed-oriented. So I think he is capturing very specifically what's happening here. So presumably, these disciples communicate to Paul some sort of prophetic insight that Paul should not go to Jerusalem. Once again, most likely because he's facing affliction, imprisonment, and most likely death. And, And it's really interesting because of Paul being prompted by the Holy Spirit to go to Jerusalem. So let's look back at chapter 20, verses 22 to 24. This is what Paul said to the Ephesian elders regarding why he was making this journey back to Jerusalem. And now behold, I am going to Jerusalem constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course in the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Behold, I'm going to Jerusalem constrained by the Spirit. But here we are in our text, having disciples communicating through the Spirit for Paul not to go. What do we do with this? Is Luke presenting a contradiction here in our text? This is a challenge for us as we try to figure out what it looks like to be obedient to a call and what it looks like when disagreement arises when there's a difference in interpretation of this call. And so here's what I think is happening. I believe these different responses result from a difference of interpretation of what should be done in light of the Holy Spirit witness that Paul will meet with affliction and imprisonment. This conflict we are seeing highlights how difficult it is to determine what God's will is, even when the Spirit might unveil that future. Knowing what will happen and knowing what to do are two different things. Now, in the context of our church, this is very specific to prophetic insight, but this challenge of of knowing, okay, the, the Spirit's revealed something about the future, but knowing what that might look like, it does present challenges, especially in a New Testament context. And this is why the Apostle Paul himself teaches that when it comes to prophetic insight, we are to measure and test it. For example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 29, the Apostle Paul says this, Let two or three prophets speak, and let the others weigh what is said. Or in another epistle that Paul writes to the church in Thessaloniki, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 20 to 21, he says this, Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good. So when he uses the language here, test it, hold fast to everything that is good, what he's really driving at here is is when there's prophetic insight given, it needs to be weighed and tested against, for example, Scripture, against, for example, what the, the bigger themes of what God is doing in the world that's been revealed to us through the teaching of Jesus. 
So, for example, the greatest commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart, might, and soul, to love your neighbor, to fulfill the great commission, to make disciples of all nations. I think this also means to spend time praying and fasting and and discerning what this prophetic insight might entail, what God's will might be when it comes to prophetic insight. Now, we actually see a more specific example of this interpretive challenge occur in our text itself. And so, let's jump right down to the second major stop in our text when the Apostle Paul stops at Caesarea. And we'll jump right to verses 10 and 11 when the enigmatic Agabus arrives on the scene. So as you're reading the text, you might be kind of wondering, okay, what's going on here? This, this prophet, this, this guy named Agabus shows up down in Caesarea, goes up to the apostle Paul, takes off his belt, and starts to enact this prophetic insight. As I was reading through this text, I was kind of thinking to myself, you know, this is a little bit strange. I wonder what this might look like in, in you know, 21st century context. I think, what if I went into Paul's office, Pastor Paul's office, and I kind of said, thus says the Holy Spirit, and walked up and took his wallet out of his back pocket and said, this wallet will buy lunch for the person holding it. I wonder how that might go. Now, Paul, even though he knows me, he might think to himself, ah, this is the first time Jordan's ever done this. I I wonder if I should maybe test this, see if this is a little bit legit. I wonder what Paul might do in that context. So even though in our text, Paul doesn't really give us much about Agabus or even why he arrives, we do know that Agabus is a known person and a known person to Paul. Back in Acts chapter 11, we see Agabus provide prophetic insight, provide a prophecy regarding famines that would hit the known world, when known world at this particular point in time means Rome. And those famines did hit Rome. So there does seem to be some validation here, and Paul does know him. So look at verse 11 here, right? It's really interesting what he does. Part of what we see happening here is Agabus doing something that would have been very common for Old Testament prophets, where they do enact out a prophecy or prophetic insight. But when he says the phrase, thus says the Holy Spirit, this is very unique, and this is new. So he's kind of taking a little bit of the Old Testament and giving it a bit of a New Testament spin here. But he takes off his belt, and then he communicates that This is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now, here's the thing. If you're wondering, does this come to fruition? A little bit of a spoiler here. We'll read this and cover this in a couple of weeks in Acts 21, verse 33 in particular. Here's what we see. Paul will be put in a bind by Jews in Jerusalem and he will be actually bound by Gentile authorities, but he is not literally bound by the Jews, nor is he handed over by them to the Gentiles. So Agabus' words have authority and accuracy in a general way, but they, and they serve as a further warning of trouble awaiting Paul in Jerusalem, but, but they don't play out to the, the letter, to the word. But they do play out in a general sense because this is generally what does happen to Paul. But here's something that's so interesting. After Agabus gives this prophetic insight, we don't actually see him, for example, in verse 12, give Paul action steps. Agabus foretells Paul of something that's going to happen, especially regarding the affliction and imprisonment that he's going to face. But we don't see Agabus say, and so do this. In verse 12, what we see is, once again, this word we. And when we heard this, we and the people there urged him not to go up to Jerusalem. So Luke, Paul's travel companions, the disciples there, the spirit through Agabus reveals something. And then there's this interpretation of that. And for Luke and for Paul's travel companions, they hear this and they say, Paul, don't go. They warn Paul not to go. We see this interpretation challenge here. And so Paul responds. And what does he say? What are you doing? Weeping and breaking my heart. For I am ready not only to be imprisoned, 
but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And now here's the thing. It's not that Paul isn't above wrestling through discerning God's will. It's not that Paul is just dismissing them here. He's revealing that he does feel the weight of this. What are you doing? Weeping and breaking my heart. This parallels, I think, Jesus himself as he was gearing up to go to the cross where he would lay down his life as a ransom for many, where he would sacrifice himself on the cross for all of humankind in order so that we may overcome sin and death, that that when we choose to believe in Jesus, because of what he accomplishes on the cross, we can be forgiven. We can have right relationship with God, eternal relationship with God. When we ask God for forgiveness from sins and move forward walking with God in a personal relationship. Jesus himself wrestles with that reality, specifically in the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus enters a time of prayer, and he asks his disciples to enter a time of prayer. And he wrestles with God, saying, God, if there's any other way, take this cup from me. But Jesus also says, but not my will, your will. Not my will, but your will. The Apostle Paul, in light of all of these warnings, he's undeterred. He remains obedient to the call that he feels that the Holy Spirit and God has placed on his life. He remains obedient to this call to remain a spokesperson for God. That regardless of the affliction and pain and imprisonment and most likely death that he was going to be facing, he remains undeterred and he does move forward, moving towards Jerusalem. We see something really interesting emerge later on in verse 14, but let's actually pause here and look at these two specific responses when it comes to our bigger themes of remaining obedient to a call of God, when it comes to discerning whether it's a call, a course of action, or a significant decision we're making, and what unity looks like amidst disagreements regarding that call even after a decision has been made. So let's start here with the Apostle Paul. So the Apostle Paul makes a decision in verse 13 that he is going to move forward going to Jerusalem. Why? Why is this Paul, why is this his perspective? More than just the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Well, we know that throughout Acts, he's been collecting an offering for the saints in Jerusalem. So maybe there's a practical reason why he's going back to Jerusalem. We know that he's, he's very zeroed in on going to Jerusalem on Pentecost. Pentecost was a major celebration and festival for Jews. Jerusalem would be packed. I can't imagine, and it hasn't crossed Paul's mind, that this is going to be a, a great opportunity to share the gospel with many Jews. And so what I think we see happening here is that there's urgency. That yes, the Holy Spirit is prompting Paul to go, but he's also prompting Paul to to go now. There's an urgency here, gospel urgency. At our elders meeting this past Wednesday night, one of our elders was sharing about some things that he's been going through in his life right now, and he made this comment. You know, we're guaranteed today, and we're guaranteed eternity, because we are 100% secure with our eternity, that we have eternal life with Christ, because he laid down his life on the cross. And we're guaranteed today, because it's now. But we really don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We don't know what's going to happen a few days from now. We don't know the future, but God does. And we can trust that God is going to use us in the now, and he's going to use us to accomplish his will. He he is in control, and we can trust him in that. And when when you really think about that, and when this becomes our attitude, it really does kind of prompt us to be a lot more urgent in the now to consider what is God calling us to today? Are there people in our lives that might need to hear the gospel? Because we don't know what, holds, what tomorrow holds. Are there people in our lives who are reeling from the confusion in our world right now? 
who are still struggling and str- not still struggling, but struggling because of COVID and the radical changes that it's impacted us. When we look at what's going on in Canada right now, it can become overwhelming and create anxiety. Are there people in our lives that could, that could really use somebody coming alongside them who, who is secure about today and tomorrow because of Jesus? And are there gospel opportunities right now in our lives to share with people? People who do need Jesus because the world needs Jesus. It needs the gospel and the security of the gospel, the certainty of eternal life, that there's more to what's going on in our world now. I think we see gospel urgency with Paul. And then the second response that we see emerge from our text from the we, from Paul's travel companions, from the disciples that are gathered here. It's really, really interesting. You know, as much as Paul knows that affliction and and suffering are part and parcel for what it means to be a gospel proclaimer, I think the, the we, these disciples, they also understand that when it comes to God's will, even if, if they're kind of challenged by it and they're not really sure what's, what's going to happen in the future, they recognize that when it comes to God's will, it's something that they can't truly, truly fathom. It's something that we can't truly fathom. Yes, we wrestle. Yes, if the Holy Spirit prompts us to do something, we respond in obedience like we see with Paul. Yes, we test it. We sift through it. We bring people alongside us to, to pray and help us discern. But at the end of the day, Man, God is so much bigger. We can't even begin to imagine what God is doing in our lives, through our lives, and in our world. But we can trust that he's acting. We can trust that he's working. We can trust that he's moving the kingdom forward and that the gospel, the good news, is being rooted in people's hearts and lives. And we actually see a perfect example of this in our text this morning. And, and it might be a little bit hard to, it might be, uh, we might miss it because once again, there's so many travel details in here. So, so picture the visual of this journey. The Apostle Paul is heading back to Jerusalem and he's stopping at all of these places where he has beloved friends, right? And, and when I say that, what I mean is church communities, pockets of believers. And remember, I, I, did, I said I wasn't going to get into all the travel details, but this is like a 500-mile journey here. So he's covering a lot of distance. And what do we see? Christian community, Christian community, Christian community. In verse 8 here, he stops at Philip's house. house. If you jump back to Acts chapter 8, early in Acts, where the early church is only really in Jerusalem at this point in time, at the beginning of chapter 8, we see this great persecution erupt. And one of the the ringleaders, one of the more zealous people persecuting the early church is a guy named Saul. Now, if you're not familiar with the Bible, Saul eventually becomes Paul, who is who we're reading about right now. So back in chapter 8, he's named Saul, and he's actually persecuting the early church, putting Christians to death. And as a result, the early Christians are scattered. Philip, in our text, He's scattered and starts proclaiming the gospel. And guess where he ends up? In Caesarea, where he starts an early Christian community. I imagine at that point in Acts, persecution, affliction, Christians being killed, I bet there's a lot of anxiety there. I bet people were overwhelmed. Christians are going like, well, what's going on? I bet that that was a big moment in their life to really trust God as they scattered. They didn't know what was going to happen. But they moved forward trusting God. And as a result, the kingdom of God expanded. The gospel took root. And now here we are seeing Paul heading back to Jerusalem, facing affliction, imprisonment, and most likely death. This is part of Paul's perspective. He understands that even though there's uncertainty, even though he doesn't know what he's going to be facing, he knows that affliction and imprisonment are part of what it means to be a gospel proclaimer. And then he can trust that God's going to use him in a powerful way because he's seen it happening throughout his missionary journeys. And now as he goes back, stopping all of these Christian communities, it's an incredible visual for us. It's an incredible example of what it looks like for us to trust God. And so here we have in verse 14, the response. And since he would not be persuaded, we ceased and said, 
Let the will of the Lord be done. This, the we, they end up knowing, you know what? We don't know the will of God, so we're going to rest in this and say, let the will of the Lord be done. And this is what unity looks like amidst disagreement. That when we wrestle through, whether it's prophetic insight specific to the text, or when it comes to more in a general sense, when we're trying to discern God's will in our lives regarding a call or a course of action or a decision, when that decision is made, we trust that, okay, we don't know God's will, but we can trust that he's in control. Let the will of the Lord be done. There's a perfect example for us in our text today. And I think that there's probably examples from our lives ourselves that we can give testimony to that when God has called us to something, we might not know exactly what it looks like, but we trust and we move forward and and we see God using us. And it's often in ways that we can't even imagine. Going back to my friend who went to Afghanistan, wasn't exactly sure what to expect. Still wasn't even sure exactly how God used him, but but saw evidence of him being used, especially when it came to... especially when it came to sharing his faith. Let the will of the Lord be done. So if you're discerning here this morning whether God is calling you to something, right, especially if it involves prophetic insight, test it like we've been talking about. And if you are opposing or or providing a differing view on someone who has engaged you with God's will for their life, I hope that you would do these things also. Come alongside them, pray with them, fast, But at the end of the day, recognize that God is in control, that you can trust him, which means you can leave it up to God and pray for that person. We see this uh, at Paul's first stop, this beautiful image. They they tell Paul through the Spirit, don't go. Paul says, I'm going. So what do they do? They meet him at the beach. They pray. They pray together. This beautiful image of what it looks like to still remain in unity, even amidst disagreement. In our text, we see relationship intact. When we disagree, let's pause, seek direction, and leave it to God's will once the decision is made. Let's pray together as we end our sermon here. Father God, thank you for this text. Thank you for Luke's firsthand account of providing us with all of these very specific details. Thank you, God, for what you revealed to us in this text a very honest look at what it means to really grapple and wrestle with discernment. That even with prophetic insight, there's still this challenge, this interpretive challenge of discerning and finding out your will. But thank you that you are a God that is sovereign and in control. And that regardless of these disagreements when they emerge, we can trust that your will will be done. That you will use us and use us in powerful ways. We see this in our text through Paul's obedience to his call. And we see it in our text when the we, these disciples, Paul's travel companions, do end up laying down at you and at your cross that your will will be done, recognizing that you are in control. May we take lessons from this. May we apply it to our lives. May this help us to be confident if we do make a decision. May this help us to be humble and recognizing that if there is disagreement, We can still remain united. We can still pray together. We can still move forward in one unified direction, even amidst disagreement when that decision is finally made. Thank you, Jesus, for this text and what it teaches us. We pray all this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Jordan. Uh, Just allow what God has just sort of spoken to you and spoken to your heart about to lead us into Uh, a time of response, a time of uh, surrender, a time of coming before God and and asking God for His will to be done in our hearts. And I I can't tell you specifically what your calling is. Uh, I can tell you as followers of Jesus what your general calling is, uh, and that is to come to Him. That is to come to His invitation to to come to Jesus, to come to the altar that he has given to us in the person of Jesus, to accept the sacrifice that is in Jesus, and to come to the Father who who truly is a God of love, like the the parable of the lost son who, who waits with open arms for people to come to him. So wherever you are this morning in your questions, in your pursuit of God, know that God has pursued you and that we are called to come to him. 
And so maybe in the, these last two songs as we finish, uh, it wouldn't just be, you know, kind of what we do, but it would be an honest time of just, God, where do you want me to go? How do you want me to live? Where do you, where do you see me kind of going into this week and following you? So could we stand on our feet? And, uh, and if, if you are, are led to, to sing out these words as, as we as a team are leading, uh, please do. But uh, know that God has made it possible for you to come to him and just be uh, one with him. It's incredible.
the promise of this song take you into this week. We've run into his arms, always running into his arms as the Father waits. He fills us with his promise that he has never left us, always with us.
are faithful and you always will be let me pray a blessing over us as we head out this week would you please pray with me Father God, we come before you thankful that you are a God that is in control. Thank you that even though sometimes we wrestle with what your will might be when it comes to a calling or a decision or a direction in life, we know that your will will be done, that you are a sovereign God in control, and that that means that we can move forward confidently knowing that no matter what we do with our lives, you're going to work in and through us for your glory, for your kingdom, and for gospel proclamation. And so I pray that that would lead us forward here from this space of worshiping you into our week ahead, and that that you would use us, Lord, that even though we don't know the future, we don't know what the next few days might hold, we know that you're going with us, you're going before us, you're leading us, and we can trust you, Lord. We pray all this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Have a great week, everybody.